You're listening to Secrets for Scaling, a Gecko Board podcast that explores the growth of secrets of successful founders and CEOs. If you've been enjoying Secrets for Scaling, we ask that you head on over to iTunes to give us a rating or review. That way, people just like you will also discover the founder stories that we've been sharing. Thank you. For this episode, we spoke with Timo Rain, co-founder of Pipedrive, a leading sales management tool for small sales teams. Hey, Timo. Welcome to Secrets for Scaling. Hey, Shannon. Uh, thanks for having me. To kick things off, for anyone who might not be familiar, can you tell us about what Pipedrive is, who your customers are, and what your business model is? Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a company which is building a, let's put it first up, very simple sales management software. So basically, if you are in a business and you want to be really good at selling, you should take a look because it's built for these purposes. And we focus on any business who wants to generate new business, basically, and, and, and let's say, if we focus even more, then we help people manage their sales pipeline. Our customers tend to be small businesses around the world. They come from all different continents, so it doesn't matter where you are. There's probably a language version that works for you. And it also doesn't matter which industry you're in because it seems to be working for all industries. And and I think the sweetest spot for, for our customers is that uh, they have a product or a service which is uh, rather expensive. Uh, what I mean by this is that it takes actually not just days but weeks and months to close. Uh, it requires multiple people to have conversations with and, and this is where it becomes uh, really useful for salespeople. We do use a subscription model for uh, for our business which means that um, you have a free trial. If you like it, you can go forward. If you don't, you can cancel and it's heavily self-serve so uh, you can set up most if not all things yourself uh, rather quickly and uh, that's pretty much i think in a nutshell you're a SaaS business correct yes subscription SaaS model yeah what year were you founded we did start a company in 2010 in june so it's gonna be seven years quite quite soon wow congratulations thanks so how big is pipe drive now in terms of both team size and traction we did pass 50,000 customer mark uh, early on, very early on this year. And, and we've been able to sustain a pretty good, consistent growth uh, throughout the years. What would you say have been some of the biggest contributors to your growth to date? Decisions, strategies, tactics, anything like that? Yeah, I have to go really far back, I think, to pull out some of the things which have influenced us from the beginning and also up until now. I think the first one was decision, really. Uh, ability and also a decision to build a product which is both simple and useful. And what I mean by this is that it's quite easy to also look at the different functions that you could really have in sales and and, and then put all these functions together and, and, and end up with a product which is very, very functional, but it's not simple uh, anymore. And at the same time, you got to understand where is the usefulness where, where this is like most critical in sales and try to build the product around that. And we try to do that as much as we could based on our own experiences and our understanding of, of the world around us. So that, that was the first decision to build a product in a sort of combination. I think the second one um, was led by the first, which was to go forward with a uh, self-serve model um, in, in sales for ourselves. I mean, our experience, my experience before PyTri was fully in enterprise sales about 12 to 15 years up until that point. And uh, going forward with uh, the SaaS model and, and self-serve model on top of that, that was quite scary. But at the same time, felt like the right thing to do because we thought that we should have a global look at things. And, uh, and self-serve was only possible because you got to have a product which is simple enough so that people could really do it on their own so that uh, setting it up on their own and understanding it on their own. And and we wanted to support that as much as we could so that we, we built you know, some of the things in there which we thought would be intuitive and then also built a large part of, uh, of, of customization and, and uh, ability to configure in it. And uh, I think that was definitely a strategy which has been working for us because we do continue to have that model and uh and we have customers coming from more than 140 countries around the world and in different industries as i said so that's the second i'd say uh, and what that has done i think is not really our decision or strategy really uh anymore but it's it's the result of that um because self-serve if it's going well uh, what it does it, it gets your customers talking about it because they want to share 
that, hey, this is what I found. I really like it and I could get it working and you could do that as well. So that is also part of our strategy today is that uh, customers do a lot of the, the selling work uh, while we are trying to support that. Then uh, I'd say one of the very early decisions was to try to remove the different roadblocks in our ability to spread everywhere. And the simplest ones that we could think, think of early on were language, obviously, localization blocks. So that was, that was something that we decided that if, you are, if you're going to be in, in Brazil or if you're going to be in Germany or if you're going to be you know, in areas which, in, of the world which doesn't speak English, then you would have no problems. I'd say that uh, we, will, we would have, have been continuing with that, uh, removing the blocks to, to the point where also the support happens uh, in your own language and all that. That leads me to one of the contributors as well is that, okay, we had a you know, self-served sales model, but we wanted to have the support at the highest possible level. That is something that we take a lot of pride in. So that's been done and continued. And I think the fifth, if I were to name that that one as well, was to to figure out marketing, given what I just told you. But you know, all this you know different aspects of of trying to put the product first and have a lot of self serve coming self serve coming from our customer side and then supporting them. But figuring out the marketing where the product ends up in the right hands of people. I mean, early on with you know, trying to make sure who are the biggest influencers in the tech world and, and, and incubators. And then from that point on, like if, if we if you had a localization in Brazilian Portuguese, then, you know, who are the strongest um, influencers in that um, region? And, and just, you know, trying to do as best of a job in marketing as we could. I think that probably sums up the things that I can quickly say to to your question. Yeah, love to unpack some of that. The first part being, you mentioned that going self-service was scary. What mm. made that scary? I think it's, it's scary when you haven't done it. I mean, in life normally, right? It's, it's, you don't know the mechanics. You don't know what you can do and where's your influence. And, and I, I came from a background which was heavily measured by your ability to control almost everything, right? <laughs> so that... If I if I go out if I reach out to a potential customer then I you know continue with certain steps with the ones that uh, react positively and I it's all on me and then I do the next steps which is you know trying to understand their needs and 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 then present the solution and try to negotiate the, the terms and everything and then hopefully close it. The scary part was that now you just kind of put the the solution out there and hope that all these you know, follow-up processes, discovery, and, 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 I don't know, rapport, and also the presentation and everything that happens uh, somewhere in a world of internet and um, uh, on, 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 the, on the site, basically, on a website. And that was, that's what made at least you know, scary for me, uh, I think for all of us, but at the same time, we, have see, we had seen that SaaS models had been working, uh, given that, that, that the product market fit was uh, there in the right way. And so we had a pretty good ambition and, and, and also conviction that it could it could work. But I can't say it wasn't scary to begin with. I mean, you talked about setting up excellent customer support. How early on did you hire a support team? So we started the company in 2010 in June. We uh, were able to put the product out there as a closed beta in August. So that's two months after. And then we released the product publicly in uh, 2011 February. So after that, we went for about a year without hiring anybody into support, but we had one of our uh, co-founders fully, fully in it. Uh, so he, he had nothing else that he could do besides doing that. The more and more we went on, obviously. And then in 2012, we hired our first two uh, support people, still with the organization, very good people. And then fr from that point on, we started scaling that function uh, further and further. So I've heard other founders say before that it's important for the leadership to have hands-on experience with support. Would you agree with that? Yes, and uh, and at the same time, that's that's what I said is is that we've we've had uh, our different roles as five co-founders as we started with, uh, and and one of the co-founders was was the guy who who basically you know built up early standard, and and that's how we all got to be part of that. We we've done stints every now and then we when we uh, go through a hackathon and and try to get everybody in a, in a company to do support at the same time 
but that was some years ago when we had a smaller group and we were able to sort of attack that all together. And right now what we try to do is, is just, you know, people go through support and, and, and look at the cases when it comes to a company. I, for example, personally, I think I'm guilty of not doing that uh, as much as I, as I could though. And I don't know what's, what's the best excuse besides, you know, trying to manage the whole company. But, uh, <laughs> but I do agree with, with, with that claim is that you really, you really need to know how things are going and, and where you were just saying that you are uh, doing a good job and, and where, where's the reality. So we, we, we try to have a good sense of that regardless of, of what level you are at. And regarding marketing, um, I thought it was interesting that you were focused on finding the influencers in each market. Mm-hmm. Were you just trying to get them to use a product and hope that they'd spread the word? Or what was the strategy behind that? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, U.S. was, was I think, the clearest market for us where we tried to do that uh, sort of early on. In Europe, it was slightly different. I mean, difficult to do because it's, um, it's, it's not united <laughs> states. It's, it's a rather, you know, sort of fragmented countries with different cultures and languages and everything. But U.S., we went through incubators, tried to understand who are the technological uh, influencers and thought leaders, and then try to make sure that we can get the product into the hands. Quite often, it meant investors uh early investors angel investors that they they take a look at uh, at this and then if they see that this is something that they think um uh, the companies that they've invested in should use they you know spread the word and then also yeah as we as we went on i mean it's very difficult to do that regionally 100 percent everywhere but uh we at least try to understand a little bit of that life somewhere for example in brazil which are the biggest, most influential blogs, and also connecting with some of the people. But I'm not going to say that we had a very deep dive into different regions uh, to be able to do that regionally so well. What I'm just saying is that we try to hit on something where we thought that, okay, now, we are, now we're getting the right traction and now we have the product in the hands of people who are already spreading the word. Switching gears a bit, how have you defined and set meaningful goals? I think that what has helped me personally is to break it down a bit. Otherwise, it, I've always kind of felt that when we talk about goals and it's a business, it quite often steers you to think that the goal is, is financial uh, side, of, side of it, right? That, that's revenue and, and that's what it is. Uh, for me, what has been helpful is to break it down into three pillars so that I look at setting goals for three different paths. One is definitely, obviously, business. Uh, but... Th- the one that I think comes before that for us is, is the product itself because that is, you know, the, the driver of the business. And then also what I think comes before that is the organization, uh, the team that we're building. And, and having this breakdown, I've always looked at them as, as we should have goals for each, basically. And uh, so when we look at the product, then uh, we need to understand what we want to build over long term and, and over short term. And, and then set goals uh, for long term and set goals for you know short term. And then when we talk about organization, we need to understand if we want to build something like this, what sort of people we need, what sort of teams we need, at what certain points uh, we need them. Like you asked about uh, support, that was clearly the first sort of function when we started hiring for. And then we went to immediately into hiring engineers and you know other other functions to follow but just understanding what sort of an organization you want to build and and how you want to scale that i i, I felt that we always need, needed goals which are specific to organization as well and then business obviously i mean it's last but not least and sometimes it's first just understanding what sort of business growth you should be on and i think that's that's quite tricky because quite often i think companies are influenced by outside force forces investors obviously and for investors i think every growth they'd like to see is 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 a hockey stick or or very 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 steep curve right but it's it's important to recognize what sort of growth you're able to produce and and also understand whether you're in a game uh for one or two years really and you don't know what's going to happen then or you or you are building something sustainable over long term I think that all kind of matters when you choose the right business goals there. But definitely, you know, this breakdown is is one thing that I'd point out, which we've done to make sure that we can have uh, definition and also meaning in goals. Um, And I think the second point is, as the company has grown from a team of five people, you know, to to 20, to 50, 100 more, then just find the common language 
that we can use when we speak about gold. And I think that's ongoing process because as new people join, you you, know, you kind of you know, need need that all the time. Like we we refresh what language is. And I think what is maybe even more important is to find the right routines in in terms of um, how we talk about you know the goals and where we talk about them, where we set them, uh, what's the cadence and 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 for setting and for tracking, and uh, and how we do it in teams and the whole organization. And I think paying attention to to the routines that we need in place to make sure that we can you know have goals and 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 and, and we can have a good tracking cadence. Uh, and on language we understand when we talk about them. I think this is the second thing I'd, I'd mention here. I'd love to hear more about a lot of that. Starting with the business goals, how did you decide which track to take? Because you mentioned hockey stick growth or long term. Where did you end up on the spectrum and how did you get there? Yeah. So one thing which has influenced us a lot is is knowing that when you choose to serve small businesses, and, and by the way, the backstory there is that we when we came uh, to build Pipetra, we realized one thing, that it's uh, clearly evident in the market that it's not a problem to build for large enterprises to build the CRMs and sales management tools uh, because the products were out there. Um, and at the same time, we realized that it's more difficult to build for salesperson or with salesperson in mind because they don't normally end up being ultimate decision makers and, and they would you know, quite often use what the company asks them to use for from tracking sales, right, or customer relationships, and and we knew that because we wanted to address this very need of building for the salesperson, helping them first, and then the sales manager second, and then having these small businesses as customers, we knew that we need to also set goals which would help us uh, acquire these sort of businesses rather than have this idea and ideology and then. Uh, have goals which would push us into up market where we end up serving enterprises where first the product is not ready for this and the organization as well. And 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 that is not really the, the DNA of, of what we've been doing. So, you know, business goals, that ideology has helped us. So we always, uh, you know, when you talk about the KPIs that you could have in, in a business like that, you could have um, a, a number of customer goals, right? How you grow your number of customers. You can have a goal around how you um, uh, grow the the size of, of your customer, basically. First of all, in terms of users that you are able to get and then also then the revenue uh, per user. And um, we have always wanted to focus on our ability to to get the customer so that the customers could help us to sp- you know, spread the word around and uh, not to take a, too much of a focus on this revenue per customer where, where we would end up in in um, uh, looking at money as, as, as the sort of the highest uh, standard. Um, and at the same time, obviously, we have, uh, when we talk about number of customers, we, we do the math and calculate. We have our MRR and ARR goals. Uh, so that's not uh, missing, but I, I, I think that that's how um, we've been able to, I think, choose the business goals based on the based on the KPIs. How do you tie those two together? What does a big picture look like for Pipe Drive in terms of making sure the team understands what metrics they should be focused on and how they communicate and align over those metrics? Like I said, it's it's an ongoing uh, development for us. It's um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't feel that we are exceptionally good there. I, I feel that we, we are making progress though. And, um, and as I pointed out, I mean, you, you, look at the, you look at the reality that you would like to see in, in, uh, in, in business terms, in terms of the performance indicators. And, and for us, it's, it's knowing that we need to have, you know, good number of visits and then people signing up for trials and then customers that we can acquire and, and hopefully customers that we can retain. Um, and then, uh, you know, MRR and all that number. And then obviously the other sides of, 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 of the business, which is actually the driver of it. It's that people look at this product, they like it, which is, you know, we use NPS for that. And that's not only product obviously, but, but that's the whole experience of, of support and, 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 and sales and, and the product. 
and then when we look at the product different sides then you know how active that this has been used and everything so but yeah how do you how do you get it all together i think there's a point here which which i have to make which is is that um, at first when you start it as a you know company or a startup most of that is manual uh, so, you know one way or the other you try to you know put this together and that's fine and at the same time you want to get all these things more automatic and and we made an investment two years ago um, into building a data warehouse where you can really have all these you know, metrics uh, together for for a business, so that we can we can have a solid uh, set of them. And then you know when we look at and, and try to forecast, and when we look back, then we know that these numbers you know, stay the same way. This has been an ongoing process, learning process mm-hmm. for you guys. How have you improved that process over time? And what advice would you give yourself if you're starting all over again uh, in terms and of setting process, goals? In terms of setting goals. Well, we've tried to get better in, in picking our focus. And um, and obviously, it starts from a group that sets goals for the company, which is the executive team, and then tries to get everybody behind uh, with all the different departments and teams. And you can always ask whether we have enough focus. And it starts from, do we have too many goals? Are they somewhat vague still? Especially when they're not, you know, the financial type of goals, right? And I think, you know, just picking your focus so that, uh, for example, instead of communicating that we have, you know, seven goals for this year, you, you, you just communicate you have one or you have two or three. Uh, obviously, you have more, but, but the question is, what is it that you communicate as, as the most critical, the, the one that you go after? I think that's one track that I'm trying to measure our ability is how well we're able to pick our focus. Uh, um, second is obviously communication of that because um, nothing just stays there. You have to do it every month uh, and, and um, react how you're going and how these... Um, Goals are actually tracking. So communicating that, you know, every month at least. A month I'm saying just because that's, for example, in our company, it's a time when we get all of our company together to look at how we've done and, and, and how things have been going in different parts of the organization. So this is where it has to happen. And uh, and then also uh, when the different departments do their work and they set their quarterly goals or, or, or whatever the cadence is, then also that this is where it gets done. But, uh, but the last point I think is, is the clearest one. I mean, I've known going into building this organization that you got to you got to repeat and repeat and repeat the things that you you want to see happening in some time ahead of you as being your, your goals or your focus i still feel that we we don't do a good enough job there and we need to find out be, better ways to do that so that will be my advice to myself or anybody else really i don't want to put words in your mouth but i'd imagine that that number one goal to focus on is fulfilling the company's vision do you say that's true? Long term, yes. Switching gears again a bit. Mm-hmm. Would you say that you've been successful in scaling and maintaining your culture as the business has grown, like from the 30 person hump to the 50 person, 100 and beyond? And if so, how have you how have you done that? I'd like to think that, but there's kind of like no easy way to measure it, <laughs> to be honest, yeah. I think. Um, there are some ways. Obviously, you have um, your know, internal net promoter score for you know how people feel and whether they would uh, like to recommend that experience. But but I still think that it's it's a little bit difficult to fully understand whether what we had as a, as a culture when it was like a thirty person group and what it's like when it was hundred and two hundred. So, I, but I but I have an answer for you in terms of how have we I, when when you asked whether we've had, I'd like to think that that yes, we've been able to do. That uh, and and the reason I'm saying that because I I, <laughs> I don't want to say otherwise because we've I think we've done quite a lot in order to achieve that so I don't want to feel <laughs> feel like a failure when I answer but but uh, but when the question is uh, how or or what have we done then I think the biggest area uh, for us has been hiring first and foremost with 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 a lot of scrutiny. Uh, for all roles and and with managers heavy involvement so what 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 that has created is that our hiring process is rather long so it doesn't include only one or two interviews but it normally includes four three or four depending on on the roles sometimes more but uh but that's the, i think the average and and then also the different types of um test work that people do and uh so I'd say that this 
area for us has been the, the, the place where we create the culture because I don't think that after that we can do a whole lot. I believe in people coming in and, and our ability to uh, find the right fit. And I don't believe in our ability to influence people too much to be somebody else, you know, if, once, once they're ready in a company. To make sure that we can get the right people, uh, what we've done is that uh, we've tried to work out what are or define the, the right competencies when we talk about the role. And then also generally, we have tried to define the, uh, what's the right character that we should be having in all of our people, regardless of the roles, ranks, whatever. And then we go into this hiring processes knowing what we want and, uh, and try to come out at the other end with a person who seems to be exactly that. And, uh, and we should be confident that both of us can continue being themselves. I mean, the group as it's currently um, you know, made up and the person who join, joins. And, and I think that's how we sort of continue with the culture. I really don't believe in, in an ability to or, or an attempt to talk about a culture and then have a really good culture. Yeah. I think that we have to do certain things and, and be ourselves to continue having that sort of a culture. And I th I'd, like I said in the beginning, I'd like to think that we've been able to do that. Right. It's more of an organic thing that grows and evolves with the company. Are there any specific things that you do or questions that you ask candidates that pop in your head that help find those cultural fits? or the, to help learn more about someone's character? Yeah, definitely. I mean, first of all, I'm not going to go away from the fact that when you involve the people who hire, I mean, hiring manager, the team, they will have a feeling, they will have a sense. So I'm not going to be able to name all the questions that they might use. Um, some of them use, you know, some kind of funny questions uh, that, that, that make sense for them and then help them understand the type of, uh, the type of fit there. But would we do have sort of overall set of set of things that we look for and I'm, I'm sort of breaking it down so that we we get a really good individual producer when we talk about this sort of personal fit and also somebody who works really well with others and, and I want to just quickly name the things for example that we we try to understand is is is, is really important for us to see whether people are able to feel this connection with the work that they do so that they actually get more energy back from the work uh, that they spend in and we can ask questions about that whether this whether there's evidence you know for that for that person we really make an important point of having people who have higher standards uh, high standards for themselves regardless of what others say whether they get feedback or not these people normally are very very usually out of the comfort zones and they're able to operate and we can ask questions about that you know these sort of examples in their lives and then also the ones that take the position of, of power rather than a position of, of being a victim when things don't go the way that you want. And, and again, the questions around whether, whether you are that type of a person, decision-making in your life so far. And, and by the way, some of the things I'm mentioning here, we make mistakes on. I mean, there's no... You, you try to understand and you try to detect the fit, but when it's deep in the character, sometimes it's also hidden. And it's especially hidden... When we talk about a hiring process, for example, when you don't have references that you can rely on as well, and sometimes you don't, so it's only the conversation uh, and then the test work and repeated, you know, interviews. So sometimes you make mistakes, but 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 I'm talking about what we try to understand. And when we talk about the you know a person who can work really well with others, is that we look whether they are more influenced by the team that they join than than just you know their own ability to have a good career move an ability to be teachable and whether they've been able to control their ego <laughs> in their life a lot. And just overall, I don't know what else to say, overall good people in terms of uh, the ones that they, 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 they just tend not to be toxic and they tend not to be ruining the days of other people around them. So there, there are certain things that we, we share the workload so that, you know, I do the work more on a sort of very high level in terms of the specific role, but I'm looking at this sort of character fit more. But at the same time, hiring managers uh, have their own set of questions where they want to understand whether the, the character is there that they need. I don't know if I gave you too many really good questions as you asked for that, but uh, I, I'll give you a couple. I, I'm asking people, and that's for me really, I, I'm asking people um, at least these sort of questions. One is whether they really feel that the work they do is sort of like their thing that they should be doing 
That's, that, that, that's their work. They feel that they found it. They feel that the certain emotional connection which is there, the certain fuel that nobody can take away that they get from it. So I, I ask about that. I do also ask about how they feel about other people in the world. And I don't want to hear so much, you know, how they, how they deal with other people, but I want to understand how they feel about other people. And the specific questions are, you know, what they don't like in other people. And, uh, and I want to see how the nervous system reacts to certain things. I expect people to be obviously very authentic. That's the whole game. But, uh, but that's, that's one of the questions. And I also ask people about themselves. But what do they think they, that makes them difficult to other people? Because I think everybody is. The reason I share this question is because you asked. But, uh, but I think that everybody should find out what is their set of things that they want to learn about people. And then come up with the type of questions and lines of questions that help them to detect that sort of a fit. But this is what I, I found that really helps me understand, you know, what makes people tick. Yeah, those are great hard-hitting questions. Hard-hitting but high level. I like it. What has been your biggest personal challenge as a founder growing the business? That's always very good to kind of look back and think of these things. And, I, I, and at the same time, sometimes I struggle uh, to, to come up with what has what have been the biggest personal ones. and But I, I, I think I'm able to name at least two or three. I mean, first, early years, and I think many people share the same experience in, in when they start companies, just personal survival. Just being able to take uh, your life, which was maybe somewhat different before you started a company, but because maybe you had it like I did. You had a, had a role or a job which was already years and years, you know, producing you the, the type of salary. You were able to do that um, by performing and, and then throwing all that away and, and going into something where you don't have a consistent flow of salary and you don't know when that's going to happen. And when you have a family to support uh, and to provide for, that just, you know, that has an impact. Uh, and for me, that definitely had a very deep impact because... Um, all the different things that we've been able to rely on um, were, were suddenly not there anymore, you know, kind of sometimes uh, uh, violently or abruptly taken away or whatever, but just, you know, personal survival so that you can, you can just provide for the basic things for your family so you can continue living. Obviously, w with that challenge, what you, what you have in your head is that, am I able to do that? Uh, but, you know, just staying true and... Uh, and, and sticking to it, I think, uh, is, is what, what helps. After these first early years, I'd say that seeing the fact that, uh, you know, us as a founder group, you know, five guys uh, to begin with, that we differ in terms of our managerial ambition and ability. And as we needed to grow the company, you know, each, each one of us had to, you know, take on different roles as we went on. And just realizing that we can't depend on that group being the, you know the, the management team forever just then um, going out and hiring an exec team which included only a few of these founders and but not all and that you know that you have relationships when you start things like that and then and, and, you know just talking about the things like you know somebody you know maybe wants to think that that they, they could also be part of that management team, but at the same time realizing that you know if they then I if they don't have an ambition maybe to lead a certain part of an organization and and also the the knack for it or or the the, the as strong of an ability they they might have strength somewhere else then in your head kicking them out of of that the exec team trying to make sure that they are still part of it but but there's a different role now and uh, I think that was definitely also sort of a personal challenge because I had personally built the company with with these four other guys and uh and i think the last uh one that i can think of um one of the things was that we had an idea of what we wanted to build as a product and personally i've i felt uh with another co-founder that we shared the product vision with is that getting that strategy out of your head into the heads of other people so that it uh it can really scale i mean that is definitely one of the challenges has been because you'd still tend to have a bit richer version of of your product strategy in your head uh, when you when you started with it, and then just figuring out how you can write things down, communicate, and, and over and over again, and, and find different angles where you where you understand that people are in right position, in leadership positions, that they can take that on, and 
and they, they share the same type of vision. I think that's also one of the challenges that I've, I've experienced. Yeah, those are all great or not great, but tough challenges. How, starting with the last one, starting with the communication, what communicating what's in your head, have any of the tactics that you've tried seem to work best? You know, you mentioned like just repeating it over and over and making yourself do that. But is there any other way, form of communication that has worked for you? Yeah, and I think the first one is that, first of all, you have to have the type of leaders that you hire, that you feel can, can do the job. And, and, and want to do the job of, of taking the vision, taking the responsibility of, of building something which is not there and then coming up with a plan to get there, right? With, with product teams, with engineering teams, with marketing, supporting all that. So, so that starts, for me, that starts from that. I don't want to overcomplicate this by coming up with an answer which, which um, maybe explains some of the routines too much in detail, but... But just the fact that these people who share the, maybe it's the original vision, if, you know, in our case, these people are still in a company, sometimes they're not, but, but uh, who have a really good understanding of what uh, the vision of, of, of the company or the product uh, needs to be, and the people who are making all the decisions long-term and short-term in the product management organization, that they, they have to get together and, and work together and... Uh, and, uh, and and try to make sense of things because it's, it's so easy to lose the meaning when you just write something down. So you have to come up with examples again, hopefully write these things down as well. So that's what we try to do is create these sort of occasions where we get together, management uh, team is there looking at uh, the problems that we want to solve. Then the product management team is is you know looking at the more specific, more detailed level, and then just painting that canvas together in a form of problems that we've tried to do. Maybe that's one of the things is that just instead of trying to paint everything in in form of solutions or or functionality or the way that the product really looks, you know, try to speak in a language of problems that we're trying to solve at a at a high level and 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 going down, and then. You know, recording these problems, writing them down, and then having them on the desks of people who who, who really make it make a difference in terms of building things, and then they know that okay, this is the problem. I understand why. I understand how it goes into the bigger pictures, and this is what what I need to solve. And and here's my best attempt of of solving that in terms of UI or actual functionality. As a final question, now that PipeDrive is nearly seven years old. If you were going to give any piece of advice to founders who are just beginning to scale their business, what would it be? Shortest way of saying that, do it. Mm. So life is so big and it's so much out of a control of a single person. So you never know exactly what will happen, but I think you should do it. I, I don't think you can quite live with yourself if you don't, um, if you know what I mean. That's amazing advice and also a great point to wrap up at. Thank you so much for joining us today, Timo. Thank you, Shannon. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Gecko Board's Secrets for Scaling podcast. If you know of someone who you think would be a great guest for Secrets for Scaling, or if you want to share your own scaling story, email me anytime at shannon at geckoboard.com. We'd love to have you. If you've been enjoying Secrets for Scaling, please consider giving us a review on iTunes. We'd appreciate it.